Enrique Figueredo is a Jesuit from Asturias in the north of Spain, and for eight years he has been the head of the Casa de las Palomas Blancas, the House of the White Doves, a professional training school specialized in the manufacture of wheelchairs and which is known as one of the best in the country. Every week, he and Sister Kampat travel around the villages of Cambodia giving wheelchairs to those who most need them. It's a long time since any Westerner has been to this region, and the moment he gets out of the car, Kike, as he likes to be called, is surrounded by curious children. Mien Khan was widowed five years ago and lives in a modest shack with her four daughters. Nampik, the youngest, suffers paralysis of the legs, which among other things prevents her from going to school. In the yard, Kike helps Nam pick as she tries out her wheelchair for the first time. Every year, someone from the mission will come and visit her to check the condition of the wheelchair. <laughs> from now on, Nampik will be able to make her own way to school and play with her friends. At least she'll be able to live a slightly more normal life. Back at the car, a peasant tells them that in a house on the outskirts of the village live two brothers, polio victims in subhuman conditions. Kao and Tok Lai have spent their short lives sitting on this bed, taking care of their grandmother. The young one is also autistic. They tell Kike that their parents left a long time ago to look for work and never returned. Kike is worried. If he doesn't find the parents, he can't take the children to the mission. He'll never forget the sad look of Toklai. Our journey along the Mekong is coming to an end. Before flowing into the China Sea and Vietnam, the river forms an extensive and complex delta known as the Nine Dragons. A network of 5,000 kilometers of natural and artificial canals carries the waters to the rice fields. Rice is the most important crop in Vietnam and provides a living for 70% of the population. Each hectare of land produces eight tons of rice a year. All land belongs to the government, which leases it to the peasants who work it. In exchange, they have to give 10% of the harvest.
The success of the harvest depends on the summer monsoons. If these do not come, the level of the river falls so much that the seawater invades the rice fields, destroying the crop and causing starvation. Kanto is the largest city in the delta. It's small in size, but has a large population. It's five in the morning, and in one corner of the market, the Li family runs a flourishing fish business. Wei is 30 years old, and she is responsible for organizing the sale of the merchandise every morning. Her biggest customer is the government itself, which in turn sells to the restaurants and the workers in the state factories. Along with her, another 15 members of the family help to unload, classify, and clean the fish. The market in Canto is an example of the rich gastronomy of Vietnam. There are over 500 different dishes, but all of them are served with rice. The Vietnamese boast that they eat everything that flies except the airplanes, everything that swims except the boats, and everything with legs except the tables. And they're not far wrong. Some market stalls sell delicacies which would turn the stomach of most Westerners. Vietnamese markets are also a good place to witness the ingenious ways in which people earn a living. The air cleaners, a job with a long venerable tradition, is a good example. Eight o'clock in the morning and the Lees are still busy at work. They transport the fish in primitive fish farming boats. One of the Yue brothers and his elder son Dan, who's 12 years old, are responsible for unloading. All types of boats come to the market to buy and sell many different things in the numerous floating markets around the delta. Most people live in small villages and never very far from the water which is their only means of transport. There are some roads in the delta built by the French when they colonized this country and the Americans during the war. Most road transport depends on the ferries, but traveling this way is not easy. Because of lack of space, the farmers lay out the rice to dry along the roads, making it very difficult for traffic. So the Mekong has become the only real way to transport goods. The small boats, in turn, supply the much larger ones which travel to the most remote villages of the delta. It's nine o'clock in the morning and in the floating market of Phong Dieng, a few kilometers to the south of Canto, it's almost impossible to move. At times, it's difficult to know where the land ends and the water begins. The delta was, until the 18th century, part of the Khmer Kingdom of neighboring Cambodia and was the last region to be annexed by Vietnam. 
The Cambodians have not forgotten this territory, which still today they call Lower Cambodia. It is one more reason for the mutual hatred between the two countries. Like the river, the streets of Canto are bustling with people. We mustn't forget that 77 million people live in Vietnam with a population density of 230 inhabitants per square kilometre. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, the Lee family gets ready to return home. Today, they have sold fish worth $405, an absolute fortune if we consider that the average salary of a civil servant is not even $30 a month. They are a typical upper middle class family with annual net income of almost $5,400. The Lees live quarter of an hour from the market on the other side of the main branch of the Mekong in a group of floating houses. Their life revolves around the water and fishing, so much so that Twang, the grandfather, spends his spare time trying to catch the odd little fish. As soon as they get back, the women have to take care of the children while the men prepare the fish for the next day. The technique they use to breed and store the fish is very simple but very effective. The fish are kept inside cages underneath the houses and all they have to do to catch them is to lift the trapdoors in the floor and put down a net. The current of the river constantly renews the water inside the cages. Then the fish are taken to the fish farming boat where they are all sorted by size. The smallest are returned to the cages. In another room, Nan Trang prepares the food for the fish, a paste made with flour and dried fish. Then Dan, Wei's son and his cousin distribute it through the cages. As soon as they have finished feeding the fish, Dan goes off to school. At 12 o'clock, all activity stops. It's time for lunch. Normally, the women and children eat first in a separate room. <laughs> for the Lee family, lunch is almost a sacred ceremony, especially for the men. This is the only time in the day they can relax and chat. <laughs> Surrounded by a delicious variety of dishes of rice, vegetables and fish, they start eating, all the time laughing and discussing their favorite subject, the family business. The atmosphere helped by the rice liquor. The women in the background make sure they have everything they need. Soon it'll be night again and little by little the inhabitants of the Mekong Delta return to their homes. Dan and his friends spend the last hours of the day watching television. Tomorrow they will again have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to help their mother in the market, then return home to feed the fish before rushing off to school. But Dan doesn't mind. 
He well knows that in a few years, this flourishing business will be his.